Like, he's a villain who ends up murdering children. He can murder his girlfriend. It's okay. I felt like I'd fallen asleep and missed half the movie. It gave me whiplash. Out of fucking nowhere. And I really mean nowhere. Because it's young adult fiction. And for some reason, we can't have the best possible story. You don't need to worry about ruining his status as a romantic hero. And that's basically how the movie finishes. So, I recently saw the new Hunger Games movie, A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, um, and I made some observations. I, I started off wanting to do like, just like a straight review of this film, but as I was thinking more about it, I started to realise what it was that really made this film suffer um, for me. And it's a problem I used to notice all the time back when I used to read and critique a lot of YA literature. And this specific thing that I wanted to talk about is romanticizing bad boys or romanticizing the villain. And how, well, in my opinion, it's not just idiotic, but more importantly, I think it actually harms the story. So I've covered some of this ground in the past when talking, well, I suppose most famously sounds like the <laughs> wrong word to use, but if you're aware of my channel, then I guess most famously the Shadowhunters series when I talked about that. So I've covered some of it that in the past, specifically in the Shadowhunters series video, um, but it'll be interesting to revisit and expand on this. And let me know what you guys think, because I'm gonna present my argument that the movie at least, I haven't read the books. This isn't a review or a talk of the book. This is just the movie as a standalone, um, but, yeah, I'll present my argument for why I think the movie over-romanticizes a young President Snow, um, and I'm going to argue why I think that actually ruins the plot structure of the film, and I think that is the main problem that most of the other problems in this film stemmed from. Let me present my case, and then you can disagree. Um, argue in the comments. Actually, please do. It, it helps with the algorithm, so go for it. So I will briefly explain what this film is about before we get into it. So, A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes takes place about 60 years before the main Hunger Games series, and it follows a young President Snow, at this point just playing Coralanus Snow. I think that's how you say his name, Coralanus. It's a weird name. I'm sorry if I got it wrong. Apparently it's actually Coriolanus, so excuse me. So it follows a young President Snow, this point known as Coralanus Snow, who will later become the tyrant and main villain of the Hunger Games trilogy. So it follows him as a young man trying to make his way in the world and make a name for himself. It serves as a prequel meant to explain how he started to become the evil dictator that he ended up being, and it also shows how the Hunger Games as a concept developed and how Snow himself contributed to making the games the brutal televised event it had become by the time that Katniss came along decades later. So it also revolves around the romantic attachment that Snow formed with the singer Lucy Gray, the female tribute from District 12 who he was tasked with mentoring through the 10th ever Hunger Games. So the film had its issues, certainly, but I really don't think it was anywhere near as terrible as I've heard some people saying. Um, I thought it was, it was engaging and interesting throughout, and that's an achievement because it was quite a long film. Um, though a valid criticism was that it, it did feel like too many movies in one, and I think that's absolutely true, it did. It was a film split into three parts, um, and I'll explain more about that later, but each part felt like a separate movie with kind of a separate arc, focusing on, on, a, on a different thing, and I don't think that would have been a problem if all the parts had felt cohesive. I quite liked that idea, I quite liked that as a story concept. The problem was that it wasn't just that there were too many stories in one, it could have worked if the stories had felt, yeah, as I say, more cohesive, but um, parts one and two, I thought, worked well together. They made sense, they developed on each other. And then part three was unhinged. Uh, it did not fit at all. It ran the story completely off the rails and it ruined it for me. It was still interesting. It was still interesting and engaging, but it, it didn't make any sense. And we'll get into that later. So the world building in this movie was pretty cool. I liked seeing this dystopian society pre the Hunger Games becoming what it was. It was also really interesting seeing this world that we're familiar with, but from the point of view of the wealthy and the privileged capital people rather than the districts. Um, it humanized them and it gave a different angle to that world, making it feel more fleshed out. It added an interesting layer that, it, that you also had, you know, this elite competitive academic world 
of these top students competing for power and influence in the capital um, that I really liked, rather than just this bleak, starving dystopia of District 12. And I would have liked more of that. I would have liked more of that. Seeing how the different classes lived, the kind of more of the, how the class system worked, um, and the vastly different lives they had in the same world, and how the people in the capital came to think as they did. With that was really interesting, I liked that. So, and as we'll talk about later, at one point in the film, we just left the capital, com this is part three, we just left the capital completely. And I, I think that was a really missed opportunity. We should have stayed in the capital um, and watched all these power games play out. I think it would have been way more interesting and also have made more sense seeing as the film was following Coralina Snow, again, who was one of the cleverest, most calculating um, and accomplished politicians in that world. So I don't know why the film took him out of his natural habitat, uh, out of seeing that, that those parts of himself, those interesting parts of himself, just as it got interesting. Um, and we missed out on watching his brutal rise to power. Which was just this point, because I kind of thought there'd be more of that, you know? Um, and that's my problem with part three, but we'll get into that. Don't worry, as I say, we'll, we'll get into that later. In terms of world building as well, I also want to say that I really liked, I, like, like the costume and set department, I think did a fantastic job. I really liked the aesthetic. I thought it was really strong. Um, I thought the costumes were really cool. I liked how both the costumes and the sets and the aesthetic of the whole world, it felt quite a lot like, from what I remember from the original Hunger Games movies, it felt familiar to that. But what I thought was really cool and interesting was how it, I mean, it was clearly a, a lot of it, the, the aesthetic was kind of very like 60s and 50s inspired but with a that Hunger Games twist but I really liked that concept because you really got the impression that yes this is the same world it has that distinctive kind of look to it yet very clearly you know like 60 years before it wasn't just like they'd copy pasted how you know Katniss's world looks which I guess they could have done um because it's a, it's a fictional society, but I, I did really like that, how it just, it felt like a lot earlier, like an earlier stage of this kind of civilization or whatever. And that, that, like the, a lot of the costumes were very like, still Hunger Games inspired, but kind of with like, felt a little bit 50s or 60s or, you know, um, 40s even, like it had, yeah, there, there, was a, there was a lot of, there was a lot of that while still feeling like distinctively part of that world. And I thought it was really cool, like strong aesthetic. And that, that was, it was, it was great to see. And, I, and that's the annoying thing as well about when it took it out in, and they were just in District 12 because it just wasn't as visually interesting because District 12, which is fine. But, you know, we, we like, I just thought it would be different with snow and we'd see more of the, the cool world, but whatever. One thing worth mentioning that I did actually really like was Lucky Flickerman, um, the first ever host of The Hunger Games, as it's kind of becoming this more media focused televised event. Um, he wasn't just entertaining, but also the fact that he was funny with all these kind of quick quips wasn't just comedic relief, but it also served a point in the story. So as these games are going on and we're watching children beat each other to death, he's there in the style of this squeaky clean, you know, 1950s television personality, as I say, making all these funny quips with an all American smile. And it was effective, the contrast between how he and the privileged are treating this as like frivolous entertainment. Family friendly, not just that, but squeaky clean, family friendly, frivolous entertainment. Meanwhile, for the districts, they're watching their children being brutally murdered. Um, and that just really showed the mentality of their world and how little life is valued and kind of how messed up that is. There was this one great scene where he's trying to rearrange a dinner reservation because, you know, oh dear, the killings are taking too long. I won't be off work for a while at least. We'll be there just as soon as things are finished up in the arena. Please, please you know, hold the reservation. And it's just great at showing how mundane and normalized something as shockingly barbaric as the ri ritualistic killing of children has become in this world. Um, like it's an inconvenience for him that the kids aren't dead yet because he might miss the reservation at this fancy restaurant. Um, it, so this he, this character and kind of the comic relief there, it was effective up to a point. So there was one moment, and spoiler, by the way, this whole video will be full of spoilers because I can't properly analyze a film without telling you what happens. So spoiler, you have been warned. There's one of the, one of the children in the Hunker Games, this little girl who survived almost until the very end. I will show you what she looks like so you can see how young and vulnerable that she looks and how shocking this scene should be. Um, yeah, so she dies, obviously, I suppose, m most of them do, um, pretty horribly, I might add. I wouldn't want to go like that. Um, and immediately after this moment that we all knew was going to happen, 
we all knew it was gonna happen and if this moment finally happens in the movie. As soon as that happens, it cuts immediately to Lucky Flickerman for like a funny quip. And it it, it just, imme that immediately took away any emotional impact that her death had. And in the cinema, I think I literally kind of rolled my eyes and like huffed, <laughs> like, ugh. Because I think just for, like, with something like that, let the audience sit in that for a bit. Let us absorb what the Hunger Games means. Innocent children being killed on television for your viewing pleasure. So immediately glossing over it and making it a cheap laugh felt really weird. And it also took away, I think, from, like, the deeper themes of the movie. And that was just a bit disappointing. So it didn't feel like effective contrasting, like I mentioned earlier, like, with the earlier scenes, contrasting the flippancy with, to show how brutal it was. It wasn't like that, it wasn't done like that, it didn't feel like that, it just instead felt like it just immediately moved on, um, glossed over it, and ruined, just completely stopped dead. The emotional impact that I felt building just watching her die, immediately it cuts and I kind of laughed, because he says something that's a quip that I'm like, oh, I was annoyed though, I was like, that's just ruined that moment. It, it just felt completely off, like it was trying to make light of something that should have been allowed to have an impact on us, for a cheap laugh. Um, it should have been one of the strongest emotional moments in the movie that brought home how brutal and evil this society is. And they, and they dropped the ball on that one. There were a few emotional moments. I don't think the film hit that well, if I'm honest. Another one was in the beginning where Lucy Gray is chosen as a tribute and she sings a song. And to be honest, I cringed. I, I found it really toe curling. It was just too, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what it was. It was too angsty, angsty singery. And it was just too silent, but it wasn't, it just didn't, it, <laughs> It felt like an angsty teen singer, like a, I, you know, I was cringing, I was cringing. It just made me go, this doesn't feel impactful, it feels embarrassing, please stop. Which I don't think was what we were going for. Maybe that was just me, but I, I cringed at that scene. But apart from that, it wasn't just because she was singing. Like, there were other times where she sang. As I say, she's a singer, she's a performer. And they had lots of her songs and her music throughout the film. Which I actually, apart from that, I actually really liked because I think it added depth to the world. It kind of, um, yeah, it added depth. It had like, there was a more rich history there. Like she has all these folk, folk songs from her culture. Um, it adds more to her character. It's important for, like she's clearly a storyteller, a performer. I think it was important. I liked that. I think they utilized that well. Um, so yeah, other times that she sang were pretty good and hit the right note, no pun intended, the right emotional note. Apart from the be that beginning song, I liked how they wove in the fact that Lucy Gray was basically, as I say, that world's version of a country folk singer. And her songs were fairly effective. As for Lucy Gray herself, I will briefly talk about her character because it was hit and miss. I think. So I really liked the concept behind her character and what they were going for. I could see what they were aiming at and I liked that. They, they were basically going for kind of a Reese Witherspoon type from Walk the Line, um, which I liked as a love interest in a YA-centered story. She felt like a fairly unique character uh, and there were moments of likability. So, you know, she was clearly supposed to be this charming, funny, natural performer who's quick with all these quips and comebacks and great, at, you know, audience engagement and harmless flirtation and getting people to like her. And Rachel Zegler, as I say, it was hit and miss. It was close, but she just didn't get it quite, quite right in my opinion. I thought her performance was quite spotty. So sometimes she nailed it and you just wanted to say, stop, stop play it like that. Like how she did, just play it like that. Keep it like that, that level. No more, just hold it down there. Yeah, and then she would lose it again and start like overacting and it would just get weird and feel a bit like a parody. There was kind of like weird mouth acting going on as well. She'd like, you know, because I say she's kind of this country kind of folk singery type and she would, it would just very like, well, sugar, my mama said. It, it was a bit too, <laughs> like, it's a bit too much like that. It felt too much like a parody. Like, it just, she just could have toned it down a bit. And as I say, there were moments where she hit it right and I'm like, just keep it there. And then she went, oh, my pink light's gone out, I'm sorry. Um, she kind of went over the top again. It felt a little bit like a little kid playing dress up. It, like a little girl playing pretend at being this worldly flirtatious singer. Um, and I don't know if that was down to Zegler's acting or the direction. So I don't think that Rachel Zegler is necessarily a bad actress, but I do actually think that Lucy Gray was a pretty hard part to nail, to be honest, um, especially for a young actress. I, th I think it required more skill than you would expect from playing a YA love interest, and she just wasn't quite there yet. But as I say, I liked the concept of Lucy Gray more than I actually liked her on screen. I thought it made sense and it was interesting that someone like 
Carolina Snow would be drawn to her and she was a good foil to him. She, she, she was basically a gypsy girl. I mean, they didn't say that because this is a dystopian world where everything has a different name. But she was a girl from a family of travellers that valued music and wore bright colours and uh, liked dancing and had their own self-contained culture. So a stereotypical gypsy is basically what she was. Um, and she was portrayed as this like free spirit basically a foil and a contrast to everything that the controlling, tyrannical Coralina Snow stood for. It was a good dynamic. So rather than this shy wallflower or um, closed off, spiky kind of Katniss character, um, she was more open, more charming, flirtatious, vivacious, all of that, which, because I, I think that would have enticed a guy like him more than, as I say, a kind of reserved, quiet, yeah. Um, she was just like opposite to everything that he had been exposed to and everything his rigid world stood for. And it made total sense that he would be entranced by this, you know, and, and entranced and excited by this attractive... <sighs> Sexy feels like the wrong word to use because it wasn't quite that. And also I think the characters are supposed to be young. I think, I don't know how old they're supposed to be. I feel like they're kind of, well, no, she's, she must be a teenager actually if she's in the Hunger Games. Um, but Zegler is in her twenties, but, Sex is not the right word, but it, it was more than the fact that she was attractive and beautiful. It wasn't just that. She was like femininely vivacious and abundant. I don't know, like thriving, like expressive, flirtatious and engaging, like that kind of energy. And it made sense that she would challenge his views and perception of the way things were. Like I say, abundant, that sounds like a weird word to use, but something about her energy was like abundant and just, yeah, carefree, but like in, I don't know, <laughs> bountiful. Lucy Gray was basically trying to be Esmeralda from The Hunchback of Notre Dame, the cartoon, meets Reese Witherspoon from Walk the Line. Um, and it was a good idea. I just wish that Rachel Zegler had been less annoying in the part. Like, I liked the idea of her, the idea of Lucy Gray more than I liked the performance, the execution. And I feel bad saying that because Zegler gets shit on a lot. She does get more than I think she deserves, um, a lot more than I think she deserves. And... I think it was a tough part and she really didn't do terribly. It, I think it is hard to pull off a character like that and for, for, and for it not to feel like you're wearing a costume or doing a caricature. But it just wasn't quite it for me. Um, I was just very aware a lot of the time that, you know, I was watching someone who is acting rather than it feeling like a real person. And I'm very sorry, but I also did not particularly like Viola Davis's performance as Dr. Gall, which is controversial because I understand that she is a phenomenal actress and I'm not disputing that. So maybe it was the direction, I don't know, but it was just way too, I'm a quirky evil scientist, mwah ha 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 for me. It was just like weird, quirky, over the top acting again. It just felt like a parody. I didn't like it. Yeah, I don't know. I just didn't find it scary. She just seemed ridiculous, but not in a cool way. It, seemed silly rather than sinister, way, yeah, I, again, very much acting, like you're watching someone who's acting, ooh, um, and it took me out of the story. So with all of that being said, let's now break down the plot and get into what I believe went wrong. So as I said, this film was split into three parts. So parts one and two, I think, worked pretty well. Um, so in part one, titled The Mentor, we meet Snow as a young man from an influential family fallen on hard times, but who still has the status and power of his name and legacy to recommend him. Um, the hopes of his family and them trying to regain their wealth and power rest on his shoulders. So they've placed all their dreams on him and he's incredibly clever and ambitious and hopes to prove himself so he can win a prize to go to the university that they can't afford and kind of rebuild their family fortune again. That's what they hope from, for from him. So he's kind of under a lot of pressure. Um, and I believe that, like at the time when we meet him, he's in the final year, but about to graduate from the academy. Um, so the school of like elite capital, intelligent children who are going to become very influential one day. I think that's kind of the idea. So yes, they're in this situation and in an unexpected twist, he and the other hopefuls for this prize, this university prize, each get assigned a tribute they have to mentor through the Hunger Games. And I believe this is the first time that the mentorship program is introduced. Uh, and of course he is assigned Lucy Gray. So if he performs well as a mentor, he wins the prize basically and gets his family out of ruin. So part one follows him preparing Lucy Gray for the Hunger Games. Um, he's trying to win her trust and then them slowly starting to fall for each other. 
Initially, he's only concerned with his own ambition and sees Lucy Gray not as a person, but as his own personal Pokemon, I suppose. And he kind of pretends to be a bit of a rebel to get Lucy Gray to trust him. When, as I say, he's kind of not, he's motivated by his own ambition and thirst for power. Um, but the risks, so the risks he takes are in his own interests and not because he's a rebel keen on breaking the rules and genuinely helping her as he claims, at least initially. It's very self-serving. The risks he takes for her that she sees and interprets as he's genuinely wanting to help, he's genuinely rebellious, he's genuinely maybe a little bit opposed to the Hunger Games, that was the kind of feel you got, when actually he, it's not really about her, it's about he wants to win. So yeah, as I say, he actually likes rules and control very much. He would just like to be on the controlling side of them. So Lucy Gray, however, she's a free spirit, a wild card, and so so she does connect with this perceived rebelliousness and selfless spirit in Coralina Snow. That doesn't really exist, but she kind of sees that and connects with what he's showing her. Um, so this is when their relationship builds, and at a certain point, you begin to wonder to what extent his feelings for her are genuine because he seems to care about her as more than just his tribute by the end of part one. So part two, titled The Prize, is him having to watch Lucy Gray in The Hunger Games fight for her life. So this is not now when you get the feeling that he really starts to care for her. Um, having to watch her in these games, you know, it's, it's personal now. Um, and he saves her life a couple of times, um, like, as from a fuck that I won't go into it, but, but he basically as he's watching, he manages to do a couple of things, he manages to save her life, pull some strings outside of it and save her life in the arena. Um, so yes, there's the understanding that he's doing it because he's got to win for the prize, but you're also left thinking, because of the amount of risks he takes and the dire consequences for him if he's caught cheating to save her, um, so you get the feeling that a huge part of his motivation is genuine care for her, especially with the snakes, because of how, because of, he basically saves her with the snakes, because of how big this transgression is that he does in order to make her immune from the snakes, it's huge, he will lose everything if it's found out, it's kind of probably not worth doing that just in case he wins the prize, so from a self-serving point of view, that action doesn't make a huge amount of sense, unless you take into account that he really does care about Lucy Gray and it's her life on the line, that he actually cares about. Yeah, because as I say, if, he, if he's caught, he and his family will be ruined. So you're, yeah, you're left the, with the impression here, at this point, that he's terrified she's going to die, not just for his own sake, but because he really cares about her. So part two ends with her winning the Hunger Games, but unfortunately, his cheating to help Lucy Gray win and save her life is discovered, and he is shipped off in disgrace to become a peacekeeper. So that they're low-level enforcers, military guys, basically, who... Um, make sure everyone is obeying the law in the district. So the guys you see all in their uniform, the stormtroopers in their uniforms, you know, who drag people away and, and the, yeah, this, the police, the military. So he's in the districts to be that. And he's left not really knowing whether she's even dead or alive or what's happened to her. So part three, here we go. This is titled Peacekeeper. And this is where the story went completely off the rails. Nothing made sense. His character motivations were muddled and unclear and it felt really out of place and the story just lost me. So in part three, he becomes a peacekeeper. So he shaves off all his hair, which there's one shot from later on in the film where he just looks like he's, what do my friends, my friends say, he's got the Gen Z social media star look. He, it, it took me completely out. I was like, he just looks like someone from TikTok. Um, yeah, someone said he looked like Eminem as well. I can't remember who, which of my friends said that. Someone said that. I, I stole that line. That wasn't me, but true. So anyway, he's a peacekeeper, shaves with hair. He's now Eminem. Um, the Slim Shady is sent off to the districts, but he bribes someone with the last of his money to be sent to District 12 to try and find Lucy Gray again. And he ends up finding her performing in a bar slash barn dance thing, whatever, you know. And it's a sweet reunion, actually, when they spot each other again. I thought it was really, a really nice moment that felt very genuine and understated. So anyway, you know, after that, they reunite. They end up having this illicit relationship, basically, while he's a peacekeeper and they have to kind of sneak off together. Uh, and during this time, as he's falling in love with Lucy Gray and seems to be happy for the first time ever, he's also trying to find a way back into the capital. And also, while he's falling in love with Lucy Gray, he betrays his friend. So his, one of his friends who was also shipped off with him to become a peacekeeper, um, and, but his friend's also a rebel and um, sympathises with the districts. Uh, and for no reason, literally no reason, there was no, he betrays his friend and snitches on his friend for being a rebel. 
again for no reason, which gets the friend executed. And then for some reason, after his friend is obviously executed, what did you expect? You live in a totalitarian state, you idiot. Well, obviously he knew that was gonna happen. So he gets his friend executed and then he has a tantrum about it and seems like sad that his friend was executed, but it doesn't seem like someone who's having regrets afterwards. It just seems like, why did you do it then? There was no need for you to do that. And then you're like, it just, it, it was so stupid. Like I saw, I saw, I saw a few review of people who reviewed this movie. I saw a few people say that the problem with this film was that there was no gradual progression to him being evil and that he just started making horrible decisions and hurting the people around him for no reason but then also being upset about it. And it was like, why? That made no sense. What was the reason for you to just suddenly become evil and do horrible things, but then be sad about it? But then you, why did you just, the, it was like came out of nowhere people said, and it just didn't make any sense. And this is partly true, but I think I worked out what the problem was and let me know if you guys agree. So I think that the problem in part three with Snow's character development was that they were trying to develop his character in two different directions at once and two contradictory directions. Um, so he gets to District 12 with something of a feeling of hope because he might find Lucy Gray again. Um, he's, he's, as I say, he's actually signed to another district, but he wants to, all he wants is to see her again. So like I said, he bribes someone with the last of what he has. So again, more evidence that he was really starting to care about her rather than just caring that she won for the sake of his ambition. So there's a score in the, is he becoming redeemed character development camp. So we've got that. And then they reunite and part three becomes this whirlwind love story where it seems like he's going to be a rebel and give up everything for her. At certain points, it even seems like he's actually preferring this humble life out of the capital um, without luxury and ambition because Lucy Gray makes him happy. And I feel like they sold it fairly well I was buying it. I was buying that he was like, he was enjoying the life that he was in love with Lucy Gray. But then at the same time that this is going on, so he's becoming redeemed. This is, his character's developing like this. He's becoming redeemed. Oh, is this the direction his character development's going in? Well, no, it's not because at the same time this is going on, as I say, he's also making the odd, random, horrible, evil decision like he does when he betrays his friend when he did not need to. There was no immediate risk to him. It would have made more sense. It was so stupid. He didn't have to tell on his friend. Uh, also, it doesn't even make sense because he also seems to be sympathizing more with the rebels as he's falling in love with Lucy Gray and the people from the districts are becoming humanized to him. So, but then he's going in this direction with his character as well, where he's becoming more corrupt. And it's just, it, that, so I think that was the main problem. And it, not because his character was suddenly horrible for no reason. Like we did see hints of his mercenary ambition and sadistic ideas right from the beginning. However, it's because the movie was trying to develop his character in two different directions at once. And it was just horrible and just ruined and inconsistent. And yeah, so on the one hand, trying to make him seem like he was becoming more corrupt by power but at the exact same time they were trying to convince us that he was falling in love with the simple life, that he was making meaningful connections and that he was genuinely happy with Lucy Gray and would give up everything for her. So that was the feel that I got from it for most of the last part, from part three. Um, and honestly, even prior to that, even a little bit in parts, you know, one and two, particularly part two, that you got the feeling that he would have done anything to protect this girl and make her happy. But then he's also running around betraying people for no reason and becoming evil. And that's why it makes no sense and it feels so weird and like he just randomly decided to become a bad person because it's so inconsistent. You can't have a story of a man falling into extreme selfishness and corruption in his thirst for personal power and ambition and at the same time, try to have a story of a man embracing the humble life as he's becoming positively changed by falling in love. Like those two things could not contradict each other more. And it's not like it's an intentional contradiction that brings up, you know, loads of interesting themes about the human condition and the struggle between good and evil within us all. No, it was just so poorly done that it was obviously completely accidental and because of incompetence. Actually, not just incompetence, but we'll get to what I think ruined the story in a minute. So then on top of all this bizarreness, to add insult to injury, after we've had this intense love story, Lucy Gray and Coralina Snow decide to run away together. And then as they're in the process of being on the run together, because they're, you know, they're all in love, out of fucking nowhere, and I really mean nowhere, they start trying to kill each other. I felt like I'd fallen asleep and missed half the movie. It gave me whiplash because Lucy Gray suddenly decides not to trust him based on almost nothing 
uh, and just runs away from him. And I think the movie tries to imply that she figured out that he betrayed their friend and got him executed. But this is not shown at all. So th there's no build up or explanation for how she even got there. So it just seems like between one second and the next, she goes from being madly in love with him and wanting to run away with him and build a life together to getting him bitten by a snake and running away from him, scared for her life, and then he tries to shoot her in retaliation as she's running, and it's implied that she got away and lived, but we never really know. And then he goes to the capital to become evil with his career restored, the end. And that's basically how the movie finishes. That's, that, like, that's how it ends between them, and she, like, and apparently, I mean, my feeling was that I came out and the first thing I said was, I feel like they cut some scenes because it just, that was such a weird leap of logic. They made no sense why they were suddenly enemies. And apparently the movie was way longer. I'm not actually sure about that, but I heard that. Apparently it was way longer. So I'm almost certain they really did cut some scenes out. But even with that taken into account, I just didn't like this whole part three. But it, it threw off his career development because for parts one and two, it's like this gradual progression of becoming more ingrained in the capital, becoming ambitious, falling for Lucy Gray, and also coming up with sadistic ideas for the games. Like he's involved in the games at this point, he's getting more and more involved. And then there's this bizarre character blip where he suddenly becomes a rebel fight fighting for the common man in love with this free-spirited selfless gypsy girl running around fields and swimming in lakes. And then they suddenly try to kill each other for no reason. And then he's back to how he was before. And it's like, what, what the fuck happened there? What was part three about? Like skip peacekeeping entirely. It was a weird character arc. If it's still essential to his story, I mean, I can't see why it would be, but maybe for book reasons it, it, he need, it was. If it's still essential to his story, have a time jump and pick up years, pick up part three years later. Like th that's fine. It's that kind of story that it would work for that. Like. But I want to see him in the capital, really becoming the tyrant that he ended up being. I thought that was the whole point of this story. So, like, for me, it just broke the flow. It broke the flow of the story completely because parts one and two were building his character. So parts one and two were building his character like this. And then there was a blip going back of him being exiled and cosplaying as a simple boy. And now suddenly for the last five minutes of the film, it goes, it goes right back up here and continues as it did. And it makes no sense. Like I said earlier, he ends up becoming you know, a fan this fantastic, if evil, politician and strategist later in life. But I'm not wasteful. I take life for specific reasons. So I wanted to see that rise to power. Like, surely that's the most interesting thing. I wanted to see that rise to power. I wanted to see him in the capital, how he started to become corrupt and screw people over and slowly gain more power. I don't want to see him on holiday making fucking daisy chains. What the hell was that about? What's really annoying about this was that parts one and two were hinting that it was his ambition and bright ideas that made the Hunger Games what it was, that he was like this key figure in forming the Hunger Games for what it would later become, that he was the one who made it into a spectacle, that he had a talent for it, and it was him who realized that if you could make it as captivating a TV show as possible, you know, where people had their favorites and it was like a drama, that people would watch it year after year and you could instill, instill fear into the populace without them even realizing. So he basically realized how effective a tool of psychological warfare The Hunger Games was. Like that, that's him. So this young man is a genius, a sadistic genius, but a true tactical genius of how to control people's minds. As we can see from this scene in The Hunger Games when he's an old man. Why do we have a winner? I mean, if we just wanted to intimidate the districts, why not round up 24 of them at random and execute them all at once? It'd be a lot faster. Hope. 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 It is the only thing stronger than fear. A little hope is effective. A lot of hope is dangerous. So he really understood from a psychological standpoint what The Hunger Games was all about and how powerful it was. And I just think that should have been explored more in this prequel. They vaguely kind of hinted that it was his ideas that changed The Hunger Games forever. And that storyline would have been so insanely interesting if they had gone with that and explored that more and stuck with it. But they really didn't emphasize or cover it enough. Um, it's like that frustrating thing when you watch a film and like the main part of the film is like fine. But then there's this like side thing that's going on that's really interesting. You're like, that's a story, go that way, go that direction. And they just don't. It's like, but that's where the gold is. Yeah, I just wish part three had been working with Dr. Gaul, the like sadistic crazy doctor. And it's at the end, again, the movie ends before it gets interesting. Like at the end, he goes back and he's gonna be tutored under Dr. Gaul. It, like, that's how it literally ends, is he goes back to the capital 
after being a peacekeeper and he's continuing as normal and him and Dr. Gaul reunite, this is what, like, part three feels like it was just weird, like a blip, because this continues on from, like, parts one and two where he's working with Dr. Gaul. Part three, at the end, he reunites with Dr. Gaul, he's going to study under her, and then it ends! And I'm like, that's the most interesting part. Why did you end it there? Like, how interesting would that have been? The peacekeeper arc just felt bizarre and out of place. Also, then, by the way, you have an additional reason, more of a reason, as to why he becomes corrupt. It's not just his ambition and desire for power, though, of course, they play into that hugely. But it's also because he genuinely, he's genuinely good at psychological warfare. He's got a gift for it, and he actually enjoys it. Because it's creative. It's dark and fucked up, sure, but still creative. And if you had no empathy, you probably would enjoy coming up with ever more complex and entertaining ways to torment people. Take the humanity out of it, and it's actually intellectually stimulating. Like, he's a clever guy. It would be fascinating to see him corrupted, not only by power, but also by falling in love with his own intellect um, and the inventive cruelty that he's capable of and this gift for control and ma manipulation that he has. Just, you know, watching him climb that greasy pole and manipulate everyone around him to gain power. Doesn't that sound like way more of an interesting story than running away to District 12 to lie in a meadow with unwashed hippies? And here's my theory on why I think they didn't do all those things I suggested in this story. Because it's young adult fiction, and for some reason we can't have the best possible story. Instead, we have to shoehorn in a Twilight-style romance for a little while and have it all overly romantic, even if it makes no sense in context. Because if part three had him in the capital slowly turning into a sadistic, tyrannical, ambitious and fascinating strategist, you know, who he eventually became, I thought that's what we were here to see. Well, if he was like that, it's harder to excuse his behaviour harder to empathise with him and view him as a romantic hero, which they were clearly trying to do. So they made his character inconsistent because as he's out betraying people, he's also got to be falling in love with Lucy Gray so that teenage girls will go and watch him being a heartthrob and make posts about how he was just misunderstood. Look at this image and tell me that this is not bait for bookish 15-year-old girls who loved Jace Wayland back in the day. Now, I didn't hear this, um, but who I was with said the teenage girls behind us in the cinema were like gasping and fluttering when Lucy Gray and Snow kissed. And of course it was in this romantic meadow. Uh, and that was the beginning of the whirlwind, whirlwind romance part of the story for part three. And I feel like that's the only reason they did it because watching him become evil would have been better than him joining a hippie commune. He didn't join a commune, but it did sometimes feel like that with all the meadows and guitars. I don't even have to check to know that people have romanticized him and that that's a huge draw for the films. Let me Google it. Let me Google it now. Today, I don't feel like doing anything except Coralina Snow, I'd do him. Yes, just as I suspected. <laughs> God damn it, a Taylor Swift edit. I hate you guys. <laughs> he makes children fight to the death and televises it, you weirdos. Look, and you can still have him and Lucy Gray romantically involved if you do what I suggested and have him slowly gaining power in the capital. In fact, I actually think that would make the story more interesting if there was still a romance between him and his grey. So here's what I wish had happened. Parts one and two are pretty much the same. And then part three should have built on that rather than taking us back and going off into weird land. As I said, I think part three should have been in the capital as he rose to power natural progression from parts one and two. So you can still have Lucy Gray by his side. She's a victor now, the story can make it work. I don't care what in rules games, in rules, sorry, world there are that, oh no, the victors are not allowed. You can make it work if you want, she's a victim. You, you can write, you can make it work. She can live in the capital, it's fine, whatever. He's there in the capital, Lucy Gray's by his side. And then you have this, and then you have this brilliant conflict where on the one hand, he genuinely cares for her or thinks he does. And on the other hand, he's deeply ambitious and doesn't really care about the suffering of those in the Hunger Games, he just cares about her, and she would hate that. And then there's this wonderful character conflict between them where they start to resent each other because she sees how corrupt he's being and hates herself for becoming part of it and part of this world, and he's frustrated with her because, God damn it, why can't she just be happy that she's alive and now she's rich and he did all of this for her. All her problems are solved. He saved her. He, he risked things for her and he gave her this life. So why can't she just do what she's told and why does she have to cause so many problems for him and for his career and can't she see he's making life better for both of them and why isn't she grateful and why won't she just conform to him? 
And then you've also got this great story about how this world, power and corruption, ruins two young people who for a little while seemed like they were genuinely in love. So with this you can go in two directions. Direction one. She stays in the capital, maybe stays with him, and just gradually becomes more and more a shell of herself. Trapped in a gilded cage, she's become everything that she despises, it feels like there's nothing she can do, she's left with no power or protection except what he offers, and of course he takes advantage of that because he can't help but abuse his power over people, and she just silently hates him for it. And she's not this free-spirited rebel fighting the system that she used to be as a young woman, probably because he proves to her every time that she tries to fight him that there's no point and he's going to win and she can't change anything. And he's not this interesting, intelligent, fascinating young man with loads of potential and who for a while seemed to show her genuine tenderness. He's just become cruel. I really need to stop adding to this because this video is too long already, but just as I'm editing, I just had the thought there. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that he shouldn't still, even when they have this kind of toxic, awful dynamic in this potential direction that if I was doing the movie, I'd take it in, in one of the directions. Um, I'm not saying that he shouldn't also be showing like moments of gentleness because that is very him but that's my point I wish that I'd kind of been explored more the layers and how he is because like how he is with Katniss Snow's character he's really interesting he's quite sinister because he's he's quite gentle and he's quite soft-spoken and he can be quite he's very polite I wanted to tell you how very sorry I am about your sister so wasteful so unnecessary so just seeing how at the beginning in their romance all these kind of like gentle moments where he's like sweet to her and like all of that how that actually over time becomes quite sinister and quite controlling and quite scary and these gentle moments are not actually genuine care but it's a control and it's quite si like he is when he's like cutting the roses and when he's like kind of smiling as he's talking but he's actually just like terrifyingly insane i would just love well he's not insane he's he's you know he's very smart and calculated but uh, like i would just love to see that like you could still have that it would be such a good story can you imagine the build-up at the beginning it looks like a love story like he's been so sweet to her and like tender and gentle and then all these same things that he's doing but it just becomes so sinister and she knows that as well as he's still been sweet but it's very i'm trying to think of an example in a film that's making me think of a film where there's like a character dynamic like that where a guy's like um where he, like she's scared of him but he's like giving this facade of sweetness but he knows he's not really been sweet and she knows that and it's a way to control and it's like i'll continue being like this as long as you do what you're told do you understand what i'm saying and just like it's a power play of like i know you can't do anything and yeah anyway i need to stop because this feels already way too long but i just i just wish that we it would just be so interesting and they live unhappily ever after and neither of them are who they were when they first fell in love and it's just bitterness she's trapped and resents him for it he knows that she's only staying with him because she feels trapped, and so he resents her for that, and the brutal world they're in ruined them both. So, like, I don't know, I kind of, then she kind of ends up, like, as an adult woman, kind of, you know, Cersei vibes of a powerful woman hating her husband. Obviously without being evil, without all that stuff, but the same idea, you know, like, there's level of power there, kind of, but years of bitterness between them, and she's trapped, um, and she's not in charge of her own destiny at that point. I think that would be interesting in a corruption story, which is what this was. This is supposed to be a corruption story. So we see her also being corrupted, but in a different way, as she feels trapped into being his wife and doesn't condone what he does, but gets to the point of feeling like there's nothing she can do against this system. So she gives up and lets it happen and stops fighting. Spirit broken. After years together, they're both corrupted by the world in different ways. Their love also corrupted and turned sour. Thematically, that would make sense for a villain origin story. You see them start off with the potential to become either good or bad, and slowly everything redeeming and good and genuine about them and their love for each other is lost. Good story. Better than the daisy chain hippies. And also it reflects reality, because hardly any terrible people start off all bad, uh, and the tragedy is in the good parts of themselves that they destroy along the way. Then we have option or direction two. So for part three. So again, parts one and two are the same. And then this starts off the same with part three. But in this version, Lucy Gray, cannot and will not give up her principles. 
She doesn't try to make herself fit, instead she keeps rebelling and keeps rebelling and is constantly on his case about being better and making a change. She refuses to make any compromises in this version, she doesn't get beaten down by the world, she will not give up her ideals, and it becomes a real problem for him. He's either got to control her, or get rid of her, because he can't be a tyrant with her as she is in his life. And in this version, she just will not be controlled. So in this version, it ends with him also trying to kill her, except this time, he actually does it. None of this, none of this cowardly, did he really do it crap, what, you know, that we got in the movie, like where he's firing a gun at her, trying to kill her, sort of. Like, he's a villain who ends up murdering children, he can murder his girlfriend, it's okay. You don't need to worry about ruining his status as a romantic hero. We're past that. Follow through and commit. If you have him, like, sort of try to kill his girlfriend, I think it's just weak. Like, why are you half assing it? This is a story of corruption, he should have killed her. It just feels like that was what they wanted to do, but chickened out, because then he would seem too evil. But it really just lessened the impact and themes of the movie and watered it down. Like, because of the kind of man he is, a future tyrant, remember? He's the sort of person that can only love her as long as he ha can completely control her, and if he can't, well, that's bad news. In parts one and two, and this is what's interesting about this, because this is when you see really see their personalities kind of come out, because you can make excuses for that in par parts one and two. So in parts one and two, he had that power over her in the arena, where, so firstly, when he was her mentor, um, he was telling her what to do, preparing for the games, and then in the games, you know, she was basically like his piece on a chessboard. So I just think it would be really interesting to see that dynamic taken out of the games and watch as he tries to exercise that control over her in life. And she slowly realises that it's not just him feeling protective because of the games, but it's about control. And she's not the kind of person that can be controlled and be happy. But instead of that interesting direction, the film thought it would be a good idea to have her change him as he becomes this free spirit for a little while before backtracking into evil again. And it's just weird because it doesn't fit with his character trajectory. If this was a redemption story, that's fine, she can change him, but it's not. So why does he have a stroke where he temporarily turns into John Lennon before returning back to being the leader of the Third Reich? He is not redeemed by the end, he is corrupted. What should have happened was that he tries to control her like he did in the games, and it becomes clear that it wasn't just protectiveness and worry for her safety, but mostly just possessiveness. Um, and either it sort of works, and she's beaten down and trapped and just hates him and is no longer the girl she was, or he fails to do that, so has to kill her. Either way, he's doomed to destroy what he loves, one way or another. And there's a, me there's a message here, there's a message about a person unable to let anything thrive because he has to own it and control it until it is crushed and no longer what he admired to begin with. Which I think would fit. He certainly admired Lucy Gray, just like he admired Katniss in later life. But the paradox is that those qualities that he admires, courage, free thinking, unpredictability, having unwavering principles and unable to be controlled, these things he admires are also a threat to him and have got to be stamped out. So Lucy, Lucy Gray is literally symbolised by a songbird throughout this movie. They call her that, the songbird. It's in the title, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. And those are the qualities that she represents. She would never be happy if she wasn't free. And he wants to own her, not out of love, but like a bird in a cage, as part of his collection. Either he traps the songbird, or snaps its neck. But it can't be allowed to fly away. And, and then look, that's something I actually did quite like in the film. Like I say, it's obviously called A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. She's the songbird, he's the snake. Not just a snake, he's a snake in a den of snakes. And yes, it was very obvious symbolism, but I liked it. He's even described, I believe, in the main Hunger Games trilogy as appearing as snake-like, as an old man. Um, and he is a bringer of death. He's, he's poison to everything he touches. He literally, the way he gains power is by poisoning his opponents, I believe. Um, so, like, he's a snake. I'm a snake. I'm a slithery little snake snake. There was also that scene where Lucy Gray is almost killed by the tidal wave of snakes in the arena, and she sings to them to try to calm them, um, and Snow says behind the scenes, he says, oh, she's charming the snakes by singing to them. We know that's not true, he's covering for himself, the reason they're not attacking her is it's because it was actually him that made her immune to the snakes. Um, but I like that implication. She's covered in snakes, singing to them, as they don't kill her, like they killed everyone else, and though she may not be charming those snakes, the only reason that she's still alive is because she did charm Snow. Um, the biggest snake of all. I'm so slithery and sneaky because I'm a snake. 
you know, she's charmed him so much that he cheated in the games and risked his career to make her immune, to save her life. I do just like that symbolism. I do. I like that symbolism. Um, there's also this quote that I found that she says that's in the book, and I don't think it was in the movie. Part of it was. I remember her saying part of this quote in the film, but when she said, like, she says part of it, she says that trust is more important than love. But I don't think they had the whole thing, or at least I don't remember it. Maybe they did. Um, so Lucy Gray says that trust is important. Quote, I think it's more important than love. I mean, I love all kinds of things I don't trust. Thunderstorms, white liquor, snakes. Sometimes I think I love them because I can't trust them. And how mixed up is that? Lucy Gray took a deep breath. I trust you though. Of course, as we know, she really can't trust him. And he really is a snake. And maybe that's why she's drawn to him. Southern in your garden, catching me a mouse. Yeah, so there are, there are obvious parallels between her and Katniss that I liked, but they were also different enough people to not feel repetitive. It's poetic justice that Snow fell in love with Lucy Gray, known as the Songbird, and over 60 years later, Katniss Everdeen, known as the Mockingjay, was his downfall. It's just, it's a really nice bit of foreshadowing. I like it. Like, he really can't escape the legacy of Lucy Gray. It is also why I think he should have killed her. It would feel like justice, that even though he killed her, he could never escape her, the effect that she had on him, or what she represented. Because a young girl from her same district, similar to her in some ways, ended up defeating him. Thus, Lucy Gray is victorious in the end, if in, sp in spirit, if not in reality. And if he'd killed Lucy Gray, Katniss's eventual victory would be far more meaningful. Like the ghosts of his past wrongs coming back to hold him accountable. You can't outrun your demons. I just think him killing her, it would just be a great symbolic scene, like a great climax so that the story of his corruption is building, the two of them become more distant, and maybe there's some defining character moment that's a completely evil thing to do, but that, you know, would massively propel his career forward. So there's this evil thing that he should needs to do or is told to do, whatever, that would help his career, or wants to do that would help his career, and maybe she's threatening to stop him. So this is like this choice he has to make. And there we go, he has to then make a choice, love or power. If he doesn't kill her, he's ruined. She's gonna do something, she's gonna sabotage it, she's gonna stop him, whatever it is. So he chooses, and boom, there we go. That's the moment that he becomes the President Snow we all know and love. That's the point of no return. That's the moment that he sells his soul and commits to a path. That's when we've lost him. The snake kills the songbird in the end. It's inevitable. They are incompatible creatures. <laughs> and what I will say, because I haven't read the book, I really didn't know where their love story was going um, watching the film. It was unpredictable, I'll give it that. I knew that Snow has grandchildren later on. Um, I remember there's a scene like the Hunger Games trilogy where he's talking to his granddaughter, I think. So I knew that and I wondered if Lucy Gray was going to become his wife. And that was intriguing. I was like, oh, is that gonna happen? How's that gonna, where's that gonna go? So I swung between thinking that and then thinking that he would kill her. And then neither of those things happened and what happened instead, unfortunately, was just nowhere near as interesting. Are you tortured by never knowing what happened to the unreleased scripts from my unfinished video series, like parts two and three from my review of Netflix's Winx? Are you kept awake at night, pondering what mysteries the 30 minutes I cut from my Rolo video could hold? 30 key minutes where I addressed his unhinged rant that it's impossible for women to have hero's journeys or be good protagonists. Did did you enjoy channel videos like I become a narcissist, I declare war on mosquitoes, and of course, ha, the classic, I talk and 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 talk. If the answer to any of those questions is yes, then joining my online cult could be the right choice for you. That's right. Over at The Authentic Observer on Patreon, you'll get access to unreleased scripts from videos I never uploaded, the cut sections from longer videos, if there are any, and hours and hours of unedited rambles. I talk about everything, like how important mood is in storytelling, and the difference, if any, between masculine and feminine points of view in writing, or a video discussing the poetry of some of my patrons, or that time Fresh and Fit had a proud grapist on their podcast. Remember Scientology? <laughs> Old news! The Authentic Observer is the hip new cult on the block. All the cool kids are signing up. 
You do want to be cool, don't you? There are so many options to choose from. Our entry level tier, skirts and stockings, is a great choice for beginners. Overgrown Harry Potter kids may feel more at home as a devoted follower of Asus. And for the alpha males amongst you, the woodshed could be just what you need. Just don't let Rolo see you. No one knows what he does to the men he catches. The Authentic Observer cult operates on an honesty system. All tiers have the same access to content, the idea being to support the channel and the content produced here at whatever level you feel appropriate. At the moment, I don't take sponsorships, so if you value the content on this channel and would like to support me, that's where to do it. Link down below in the description box. So if, like myself, you enjoy listening to the sound of my voice, hop on over to Patreon for an offer you don't want to miss. Join a cult today! Hi, welcome back. It is a different day and I am feeling, I'm feeling cosy and Christmassy. I still don't have Asus, unfortunately, but I've got a candle instead. Feels very, feel very Christmassy now, even though it's after Christmas at this point. Actually, no, there's 12 days of Christmas and everyone forgets that. That's very sad. So... Merry Christmas, hope you all had a good time. Let's get straight into it and not waste time with this. So, okay, romanticization in YA fiction. So here we are at the biggest reason that I think this film failed. They tried to romanticize President Snow, Coralina Snow, far too much, and I think it ruined the character development and the greater depth you could have had in this movie. Um, and this is a problem that is widespread in, in young adult literature, in YA literature. Um, and movies, and I have talked about it before. So even though I have problems with the whole last third of this movie, like I said, um, I didn't like it. I didn't think it made sense, and I think it was a missed opportunity to actually see his rise to power. That would have been more interesting. Like, like I say, the movie felt like it stopped just before the most interesting part and his career took off. So though I stand by that, apparently in the book, though it has the same plot, he is portrayed as more possessive of Lucy Gray, um, which makes more sense and really didn't come across in the movie, or at least I didn't think. Um, so we even have this Vanity Fair article, the first paragraph of which reads, quote, This is very much a story about love, says Francis Lawrence. The sentiment may be surprising, coming from the director of The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, but there's far more to this prequel than the games you're expecting. It's this kind of love story set in a different kind of world in a different time, he adds. A very intimate love story. He isn't wrong. He is, though. Sure, he directed it, but he's still wrong. And that here, this explanation that he gives right here, tells me everything I need to know about why this movie failed. Because you thought, mate, that you were telling a love story when actually it's a tragedy following a man turning into a villain. That's what it's supposed to be. So this article um, prompted a whole Reddit thread of, that I came across as well, of people asking if it really is a love story and if, did Carolina Snow really love Lucy Gray? Was he, did he really love her? And people were like, yeah, maybe he, he did love her. And he, did he, what's... The answer is no, I think, my opinion. So listen to how Carolina Snow talks and thinks about Lucy Gray in the book. So I found these quotes from it. So this is, this is I'm gonna read some quotes in the book. This is how he thinks of her because we get is from his point of view, this is how he thinks of her in the books. His girl, his. Here in the capital, it was a given that Lucy Gray belonged to him, as if she'd had no life before her name was called out at the reaping. Even that sanctimonious Sejanus believed she was something he could trade for. If that wasn't ownership, what was? With her song, Lucy Gray had repudiated all that by featuring a life that had nothing to do with him and a great deal to do with someone else. Someone she referred to as a lover, no less. And while he had no claim on her heart, he barely knew the girl, he didn't like the idea of anyone else having it either. Although the song had been a clear success, he felt somehow betrayed by it, even humiliated. I'll, I'll get on to my thoughts on some of this later, but that's one section of him thinking about Lucy Gray, his, she belongs to him, ownership, he's talking about being able to trade her. He realised for the first time that she would be dead in a few days. Well, of course, he'd always known that, but he had thought about her more as his contender, his filly in a race, his dog in a fight. Then the more he had treated her as something special, the more she'd become human. And then another quote here, he's speaking now. I doubt trading tributes is allowed. I've already been slapped with one demerit just for meeting Lucy Gray early. What if I try to trade her? 
Besides, the poor thing is already attached to me. Dumping her would be like kicking a kitten. I don't think I'd have the heart." So in these quotes, though yes, in some of them he's starting to humanise her, and I haven't read the book so I can't speak to whether it has the same character inconsistencies as the movie did, um, however, the possessiveness is still very clear, even if he started to change his mind. Um, so I never re really got the impression that he was that possessive of her in the movie, even from the beginning, and also it didn't come across that he was really that much of a bastard in the movie. So there's also this quote in the book, I don't know if it's in reference to Lucy Gray, but there's this quote about him, quote, "'The ability to control things. Yes, that was what he'd loved best of all.'" And that just says it all, really. That just says it all about who he is. So these character traits, this undertone of possessiveness and ownership and needing to be controlling and this kind of greed of like covetousness towards people as well as things, this character trait, which is clearly quite strong in the book, that I never really got the impression that that was a thing in the movies. Um, in the films, he just seemed like a kind of, maybe a bit cold, but more ambitious, quiet, studious, watchful young man. Perhaps a bit morally grey in some ways, but you never really got this undertone, I don't think. So yeah, like I said, just, and also just think about that, all those quotes I read, just how much to all, do all of those quotes contrast with what the director of the movie said about it being an intimate love story. So in this, you know, the ability to control things, yes, that would what that yes, that was what he'd loved best of all. So it's clearly like his own acknowledgement, his own what he knows about himself. So he acknowledges in this in the book that he loves control more than anything. He thinks of Lucy Gray as his filly, his girl. Um, and not his girl in like a romantic way, like he doesn't care about her heart, as it says. His girl in the sense that he can trade her, he refers to it as ownership, he doesn't like the idea of someone else having her for those reasons, because she's his, she belongs to him. She shouldn't have had a life before she was given to him. That's how he thinks of her, like she was given to him. Not that he's a mentor and has to look, she's given to him. Not yet, and there's like different, I think there's different kinds of possessiveness, there's like, obviously if someone's thinking of someone as like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to demonise anyone like, who thinks in that way. Obviously, there's a difference between thinking of someone like as, like, my girl or my... Like, that's very different when they're still... As opposed to, like, obviously, this is very different in terms of how he's thinking. Yeah, it's... it's She's a possession, not a person, and he owns her. It's not positive possession, if that makes sense, okay? She's given to him. Rather than, like, of her own free will, but giving her... You know, giving herself is different. Anyway, I don't have to go into that, but I'm just saying, because I know people always pick up on little... <laughs> people, I could just see someone in the comments going, actually, if someone's like, doesn't always mean, mean they're a terrible person, are you saying everyone's terrible who, no. Okay, moving on. But anyway, so this hidden thinking about her in this way, this is a really interesting dynamic that I honestly got no hint of watching the movie, and I would have liked to see how this mentality he has, that again, she was quite literally given to him, would have affected his behaviour towards her in the film. Like, how are you, how different are you going to behave towards someone? How different are you going to treat, treat someone if you don't see them as, like, a person or a partner, but as someone who they were given to you? You have rights over them. You have, like, I, I wish you could have kind of seen that dynamic, how that played out, of that control. Um, so again, I also read a passage from the book, because I, I did a bit, I haven't read it again, I don't take m fully my word for this, it, I just did a bit of surface level research into it because I was interested after having watched the movie if the book was kind of different, and I had heard it was. So this is just based on my surface level look at it, I could be wrong. But I also read a passage from the book where, so during the scene in the movie where they're, they're being all romantic by the lake, there's that scene in the film, they're being all romantic by the lake, so in the book, this scene is also there, but in the book, what he's actually thinking in this scene is being suspicious that she's only using him to play off her ex-boyfriend. Um, so you can feel that undercurrent of distrust that he has for her. Even in these like seemingly romantic moments, he's, he's like, he doesn't, he's like suspicious of her. Probably because that's what he's like. like. You know, he would screw someone over if given the chance, so he can't trust her because he's not a good person, so he's always second guessing other people's motivations. So this adds a whole new element to their dynamic. In the movie, all we see is them being romantic by a lake, and we think he's falling in love. At least that's what I remember. I've only seen the film once, so I could, but that's what I remember from it very clearly. But in the book, because we get his thoughts, we realise that he's having these barely repressed flashes of anger at her during these scenes because he doesn't trust her and he's jealous and suspicious. 
like again it's got that undertone of like ownership of it he it's got kind of abusive partner vibes of wanting to be controlling because he doesn't trust her and thinks that she's always going to cheat on him and there's like jealous of this other man that she's not there's not really been any i don't know i haven't read the book again but from that there doesn't seem to be any hint that she's more interested in this other guy than she is of him but he's still it's this even when he's starting to humanize her from again the very surface level look i had at the book it seems like he's still got this undercurrent of your mind what like and how dare you have how dare you have had been interested in someone else in the past and I can't tr I've got to control you completely because I can't trust you you know and, and from the book I would guess I haven't read it but from this that scene I read it c probably gives the impression that you're always wondering in the book when he's finally going to lash out at her because you can sense that kind of anger and distrust which I, which I didn't get in the movie so they also have this conversation where he defends the capital, and maybe I missed this in the movie, but again, I never remember anything like this. So it just seems like the book was a lot more consistent with his character and always showing that he was kind of twisted and unlikely to stand against the regime. Whereas, as I say in, in the movie, it seemed like, is he going to be a rebel for her? Is he not? But in the book, this is, this is one of the scenes. So, quote, I can't pretend I'm someone I'm not. I don't agree with everything the capital does, but I am capital. And on the whole, I think we're right about needing order, said Coriolanus. The Covey believe you're put on earth to reduce the misery, not add to it. Do you think the Hunger Games are right? She asked. I'm not even sure why we do them, to be honest, but I do think people are forgetting the war too fast. What we did to each other, what we're capable of, districts and capital both. I know the capital must seem hard line out here, but we're just trying to keep things under control. Otherwise, there'd be chaos and people running around killing each other, like in the arena. This was the first time he tried to put the, these thoughts into words with anyone other than Dr. Gall. He felt a little unsteady, like a toddler learning to walk, but he felt the independence of getting on his feet as well. Lucy Gray drew back a bit. That's what you think people would do? I do. Unless there's law and someone enforcing it, I think we might as well be animals, he said with more assurance. Like it or not, the capital is the only thing keeping anyone safe. Hmm. So they keep me safe. And what do I give up for that? She asked. Coralinus poked at the fire with the stick. Give up? Why, nothing. The Covey did, she said. Can't travel, can't perform without their say-so, can only sing certain types of songs, fight getting round up and you get shot dead like my daddy, try to keep your family together and you get your heart broke and you get your head broken like my mama. What if I think that price is too high to pay? Maybe my freedom's worth the risk. So, your family were rebels after all. Coralinus wasn't really surprised. My family were Covey, first and last, Lucy Gray ass asserted. Not district, not capital, not rebel, not peacekeeper, just us. And you're like us. You want to think for yourself. You push back. I know, I know because of what you did for me in the games. Well, she had him there. If the Hunger Games were thought necessary by the capital, and if he had tried to thwart them, had he not refuted the capital's authority? Pushed back, as she said. Not like Sejanus, in outright defiance, but in a quieter, subtler way of his own. Here's what I believe. If the capital wasn't in charge, we wouldn't even be having this conversation because we'd have destroyed ourselves by now. I'm sorry, that was a long passage, but it's worth it to kind of, because there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. So he's not really being convinced by her arguments and you can see again his ideology coming through. I, I just didn't get the sense of who, what he believed, who he was. There was no like character motivations or consistency in the film for me. But here he's talking about, he's, ta he's emphasizing again and again, order control, chaos. He doesn't like chaos. He doesn't like things being out of control. This is why he supports the capital because we need order, we need control. We need, And you see, this scene is great, this conversation between them because you can see the tension between their two characters and their differing value systems and their ideologies, which is probably what drew them to each other and also what is pulling them apart and the contrast between them. She's this free-spirited, as I said, kind of gypsy girl, basically, is what she is. This free-spirited musician, traveler, um, wants freedom over anything, thinks that chaos is, um, that freedom is worth sacrificing order for. To have freedom, he does not. He thinks order, brutality, anything, order above all else, literally, is his kind of belief system. Control above all else, even if that means killing children, even if that means brutality, even if that means no freedom. You can see that in this scene, and I just, you just didn't get that from the movie, and I get that, you, like, and this is dialogue. You could have had something like this in the film. And maybe, I'm, again, I could have missed it. I'm worried because I haven't only seen it once. So maybe I missed it. But the point is, even if I did miss it, then even if they briefly mentioned something like this, it wasn't clear enough. 
that I remembered and that, you know, so. So yeah, like I said, none of this, none of his feelings of ownership over her and his belief in the capital and having complete control, none of it really came across in the movie. And I know we're missing his internal dialogue, so it makes it harder, but still, you show it in other ways. You make movies, you know that, you have to, you miss out on certain things that you don't get in a novel, but then you have to be inventive enough to show that in other ways. You can't just skip out on a whole important part of character because you don't have internal dialogue. Be creative and come up with a good, better way to show that. And it's not hard, you can show it visually, even. You know what I mean? Have certain shots of like, a look on his face, or when someone says certain things, or do, you know what I mean? Or how he, or when she says it or behaves in a certain way that you can see him getting angry at her if she's acting outside of his control. Or, you can show it visually, that's the point. If you can't, anyway, I'm not gonna tell you how to do your job, <laughs> even though that's what this whole video is. So my friend who's read the book, said that he was way more evil in it, just in general, um, because you could hear his thoughts and it was clear the whole time, apparently, that he really saw her as his possession and he just wanted to own her, basically, and that he was also just a total bastard in almost every other regard as well. Thinking about his ambition all the time and coming up with sadistic ideas to make the Hunger Games more sensationalized. As I say, didn't get that from the film at all. Um, I just got the impression from the film that he really cared about Lucy Gray almost from the first moment. Like, from the first moment he saw her in the film, he seemed a little enchanted. It was quite literally, quite literally, a movie moment of seeing this beautiful, brave and extraordinary girl and kind of been knocked off his feet a bit and, and finding himself breaking these rules and shifting his worldview for her. Like, I remember that, sh that, that shot that was on him as, as it came, she came upon the screen as she did this dramatic thing when she was called forward in the reaping and she made this dramatic thing about it and put a snake down someone's dress and sang a song and, you know, did this whole showbiz thing. And it, it, the shot on his face then, it seemed almost like he was a little stunned, but it, it seemed like stunned and like a, oh, I see where this is going. He's gonna fall in love with that type of way. Like he's just kind of a bit knocked off his feet. Like I've never, this, I've never seen a girl like this before. Yeah, <laughs> but you could still have, and again, it, yeah, it, it then makes sense why he ended up breaking rules and shifting his worldview for her. That's where it seemed like it was going before the film suddenly took a U-turn and it was confusing. So you could still have had something like that if, if it had just been a bit clearer that this enchantment came from a place. You could still have him upset, this is the difference, because it didn't feel like an obsessive, like, covetous thing. You could still have a scene like that and, like, have him kind of obsessed with her, because I think that that attitude is very accurate to how he would be. But if you, if the film just made it a little bit more clear that this enchantment that he had for her came from a place of him just having to own this pretty unusual thing as one of his possessions rather than as a person. But I didn't get that. It just felt like genuine admiration. Like genuine admiration, like, wow, she's amazing. As opposed to, she's beautiful and not like anything else. I, she's mine. I'm, I'm, that, I'm obsessed with her now. She's good. They're different things and I just did feel like you didn't, they, they, well, like the director said it was an intimate love story. So clearly he therefore failed in getting across that kind of possessive message, which I think would have made the movie so much better. Yeah. So a good example of possessiveness instead of love. Um, and this is an extreme example. I'm not saying you, you have to go this far. Obviously you wouldn't go this far, but a good example of possessiveness instead of love is like Viserys and um, Daenerys from Game of Thrones. So he's clearly obsessed with his sister. He thinks that she's beautiful and special. And sometimes when he looks at her, how like focused he is on her um, and intense he is with her. But she's his possession. She's not an independent person to him. And he is furious whenever she exercises autonomy and acts contrary to him or like she doesn't belong to him. Even to the point where he's furious that she has a husband um, and is either deferring more to her husband or being intimate with her husband, as opposed to him, even though it was his, he sold her, it was his fault that he, you know, he did that to her, but he still doesn't, he still kind of punishes her for that because she's, she's his to trade, but he still, even though he traded her, he still sees her as his and, all, yeah, anyway, I'm, this, I'm not gonna go into character development of Game of Thrones, I, I can't, I'm terrible with not being able to not go off on a tangent, like I just can't do it, Galtea, stop, I'm sorry, but you get what I mean. So yeah, he's furious whenever, Viserys is furious whenever Daenerys exercises autonomy and acts contrary to him or, or acts like she doesn't belong to him. He loves her only so far as she's an extension of himself and a symbol of his own status. That's the difference, which of course isn't really love at all. 
Um, so you don't have to do that. To, you don't have to fully do that, obviously. I'm not saying that. That is way too extreme for uh, the Coralina Snow and Lucy Gray dynamic. But add an element of that where it becomes clear that his feelings for her are not this selfless love it was portrayed as in the film, but rather feelings that are darker and more consistent with his controlling and power-hungry character. And I just bring up this recent Daenerys to like illustrate the example of, I'm not saying you have to fully go like that, but just to illustrate the example of showing how, it, like that's very, you know, if you're showing someone obsessed and intense on someone in a way that is not loving and that you can do that in a way that is clear, that it's not a f truly affectionate. It's, th yeah, the, yeah, anyway. So yeah, I don't know. I just felt like the film was trying to show us that he was really falling in love. And well, again, intimate love story. I'm gonna keep going back to that. It was trying to show us that he was really falling in love. So that's how I felt. It was trying to show us that he was really falling in love and worrying about her safety and being selfless. And I just wish they had had it more obvious that he was possessive and just a bad person. And also, Another reason I would have loved that, because in a genre where there is constant weird behavior portrayed as romantic, like Edward Cullen and Jace Wayland are just two YA male love interest examples of, of just being terrible, you know, if he stalks you, controls you and assaults you, it means he loves you and he'll change. It would be good to see someone explicitly shown as abusive and frankly evil who engages in these behaviors. So again, for those reasons, he should have killed her at the end. It felt like that's what they wanted. It wouldn't have changed his intention or the story at all. It wouldn't have changed the story at all. Um, again, this film is supposed to be a character study of a human being becoming so corrupt they get to the point where they're ruler of a totalitarian state that has an annual televised event that ritualizes the killing of children in the most inventive and sadistic ways while they eat popcorn and cheer. This is not a man you need to worry about. What if we make him too unlikable? I think we're past that. Show me how he goes from an ambitious young man who, though selfish, has some redeeming qualities to a flat out child killer. I'm not just that, I'm gonna throw up this meme because I came across this. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about the whole forcing some of these kids once they leave the Hunger Games to sell their bodies. I, I, I don't wanna say too, I can't really say the word on YouTube, I'm trying, because they censor a lot. So, but you know what I mean? like not just killing them, but doing that to them. Treat it, he basically is just treats people, like he goes on. This is why you need to have him controlling and obsessive over Lucy Gray and like he owns her because he ends up treating everyone like he owns them. He ends up, these kids in these games, he owns them, he can do what he wants with them, but they're not just, not just getting them to kill each other, but when they leave the games, then they, they sell their bodies. They're so he treats, everyone belongs to him. He's like, they're his, they're his slaves basically, like, but yeah, so this was the biggest failing of the film. You're supposed to show his slow descent into corruption, but you could not help yourselves and you were possessed by the spirit of YA romances at the end there and couldn't quite make him kill her. Bad. No, it's the teenage girl mentality. He kills puppies, but, but he still loves her. Oh my God, he's such a heartthrob bassoon. No. <laughs> show the teenage girls that he does not, in fact, love her. And the brutal truth is, the, 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 the true fact of the world is that sometimes people who are that controlling of their partners do end up murdering them. That's what happens when those kinds of behaviors escalate to the extreme. That's what happens when the mentality of this person is not a person, they belong to me, they are a possession, they are mine, I own them, I can do what I want with them, and they're now acting in a way I don't like. That mentality, when taken to an extreme, not everyone who thinks like that is gonna end up hurting their partners. However, when taken to an extreme, the inevitable conclusion of that is, why can't I kill them if I want? Why can't I do what I want with their life? Because they're mine. That's what happens when those behaviors escalate to the extreme. It can happen. It almost happened to my aunt. And if, you know, your average garden variety, normal guy sociopath who abuses his partner can end up sometimes murdering them. I really wouldn't put it past the guy who s ends up saying this. We both know I'm not above killing children. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, I feel like they're trying to have their cake and eat it. They want to tell the origin story of an irredeemable villain, but at the same time, they're also trying to sell a love story to teenagers and feed the delusion that despite how vicious, selfish, and cruel he was in every other aspect of his life, 
he really did love her. Which is pretty terrible, because in real life, if you're with someone who's pretty consistently a terrible person who does terrible things, you shouldn't stick around hoping that they'll never do it to you because they love you. If someone is sadistic and controlling, guess what? They'll turn on those closest to them sooner or later. Don't stick around thinking they will be healed by your love. I mean, maybe that could happen. Sometimes. Rarely, I would say. Uh, and don't, don't stick around thinking they'll be healed by the power of your love. Because they don't love you. You're not a person to someone like that. You are a tool to them that serves a purpose. You can't heal someone with your love if they're not even like feeling it in the first place, you know what I mean? In my opinion, you know, I'm not saying that that, that that can't happen, that there haven't been the occasions when, you know, I'm sure there are. There is nothing new under the sun, I'm sure there's, you know, there's everything. I'm sure there's at least a few cases of someone genuinely terrible being healed through the power of someone's love, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on it. I wouldn't bet on it. It's kind of like having your financial life plan as that you'll just win the lottery. Like, sure, it could happen, but let's not sit around and hope. <laughs> Maybe pick some better options. <laughs> you know, Carolina Snow, President Snow, he and he televises the killing of children, of kids. I f sorry, I feel like people are forgetting that. This is who he, like, the, so that again, the director referring to this as a quote, intimate love story, and then portraying him as if he actually cares about Lucy Gray, is only feeding into the delusion that abusive people actually care about who they're abusing, which is a really bad pattern of behavior to romanticize. And again, it happens so much in YA, cons pretty consistently. Uh, you know, and, and I fully believe that it that it is intentional because they know that, that that's going to sell to teenagers. Um, and not only is it a stupid message, but it's also bad storytelling and makes the characters and themes totally inconsistent and confused. And I'm going to go into later why I, why I fully believe this is intentional and why I think this sells to teenagers. Um, but yeah, I think I think I think they're doing it on purpose. I don't. I, th I think they're doing it on purpose. <laughs> Um, like the whole genre, because yeah. It would just be nice to, ha to have a somewhat realistic representation of that sort of behavior that doesn't feed into teenage delusions about the bad guy being redeemed. Like sure, it can happen, but hardly ever. And it's annoying seeing writers and creators of YA fiction constantly being unable to help themselves as showing the most repulsive, abusive behaviors as the most romantic behaviors, because not only is it stupid, but it also really ruins the quality of the story. And you know, that's what I really care about. <laughs> I do actually really care about that though. Like, it is, like, yeah, you've got the whole like moral issue and is it right, is it ethical to kind of show that. But also like, it, it does just like ruin the quality of the story and that really gets to me as well. <laughs> no, 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 but like, we're gonna go into the unethical stuff in a minute. <laughs> but again, the, the reason I'm talking about this is because it, it's a pretty common problem in YA fiction. And I want to veer off slightly from The Hunger Games now and just talk in general about this genre, constantly romanticizing obsessive and toxic behavior to like 12 year old girls. Greetings, my loyal followers. So, would you like to hear a funny story? So, this Hunger Games video was supposed to be a quick video, um, just like a, a holdover until I'd ma managed to finish scripting and editing my full-length feature film, late upcoming video that's highly scripted, like in the style of the Nepo Babies video, kind of like I did that. I've got another, I've got, well, a few more like that coming, but there's one project in particular, because that's taking a while to get out and I needed video. So I was like, oh, well, as my friend suggested it. Um, I was like, oh, I'm not gonna have a video for December. Turns out I didn't have a video for December anyway, because I didn't manage to get it done in time, because th this turned out to be super long. Okay, let's try and stay on topic. This is my problem I have. So as uh, so she was like, oh, you just, why don't you, why don't you talk about the Hunger Games? I was like, good idea. So I was like, cool, 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 cool. Yeah, so that would be like a half an hour video. So as you can see from the length of this video, it's not half an hour, but I haven't even gotten to the worst part yet. Yeah, so I also, what you haven't seen is that I spoke for an additional three hours. I don't know how much it's gonna be when I edit it down, but at least three hours. The, hopefully I'll edit down to like two hours or something. Um, that I have now cut out of this video because I realized as I'm editing it that, okay, this is too long. And also this is a separate topic in and of itself. So I've got, if you're not subscribed to my channel and you wanna hear this whole topic that I've just cut out, it's gonna be a whole separate video, a whole separate long video. This wasn't meant to be a video and now it's turned into a video. So it's a whole other video talking about 
that it's sort of part two to this video, except not, because this is about the Hunger Games movie, and the video that's coming, that I kind of had to cut out, is a discussion on women. Well, no, kind of. It's, it's about, it's about YA fiction. The bad boys. Why, why the bad boys? Um... What's going on? Why are so and and why are so many books for teenagers and like middle schoolers and they're all weird and creepy? Um, what is all with all the toxic love interests in young adult fiction, primarily aimed at girls? What's with that? Also, what's the appeal? What do women like bad boys? Do they? Do, and then I'm gonna it like into the red pill stuff. What what I think what I think the appeal is. What, while also countering some of the red pill points that they present as why women like bad boys, I've got my own things to present as to why it's popular in fiction, and then talk about, d is this an argument for women being inferior? The fact, And it's a whole thing. It's a whole long video essay about um, weird YA trends. Why is YA fiction, young adult fiction, so messed up and bizarre? Why are the love interests so toxic? What does it say about women, <laughs> girls? Does it? What does it say anything about women and girls? Um, and are young women having an identity crisis as part of? It? I don't know how I did it. It was meant to be a discussion on the Hunger Games, but you know, it's it's. So if you're not subscribed to my channel and you just clicked on this video because you're like, oh, let's hear about Hunger Games, and you're interested at all in in seeing that, then you subscribe, because, you know, that'll be coming when I've finished editing that monster of a video. Um, so that's a problem that I have. I think I'm going to start going to support groups about just shutting up, not talking so much. I'm doing it now again. Okay. Um, so, so, th to deal with my addiction, or, <laughs> don't cancel me for that, guys, don't, it's a joke. <laughs> to deal with my addiction, of, oh, I don't know how to deal with it. I, I'm not really dealing with it. I'm just talking and making, just talking. So if you would like to see this video of me talking about bad boys, why do women like villains? Do women like villains? Do women like bad boys? Do women want to be abused? Like some people say that that's the evidence for. What do I think about that? What's my counterpoint to all this evidence that the women just like been treated badly? Is that, is that women? Women. Hmm, women. Um, are women inferior? Is this what this tells us? Wow! Subscribe and come back in a little while for when I've edited the... I've got something in my hair. Oh, other side. Okay. Um, come back soon. What is that? Come back soon. Um, to see what I've got to say and argue for are women inferior? I don't think they are. Some people think that... The women's fiction choices are evidence of that. So let's discuss next time that somehow became a whole topic from what was supposed to just be me talking about the Hunger Games. Welcome. Welcome to the channel. Join, join, pull up a chair. Make yourself comfortable because cause, cause you're in for a long, long time. Long ride. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that I talk a lot, so... You might have to deal with that. Okay. Okay, bye! Enjoy the... Oh, so, so, okay, so that's my point I was trying to make. So I've just cut out, like, a couple of hours from this video in this section here. There's going to be a different video that I just talked about YA fiction. I talked about all that stuff, all that juicy, interesting stuff. Ooh, so juicy, so political, so cultural. Ooh, um, women. Ooh, toxic relationships. I don't know. Um, so, you know, that's all cut out and that'll be coming soon. But now it's going to go on because I realised it was just two different topics that didn't make sense in the same video. So now it's going to skip to the end of that video. Um, the end where I talk about the Hunger Games again. And I tack it back on at the end. So now it's going to jump. So I've been talking for... I'm, I'm going to stop now. Okay, bye. Having said all of that, um, I am not saying that the portrayal of Snow was as bad as all of everything I've just said um, in, in the movies. Because I know I went off on a long tangent about villains and bad boys and abuse and it. The portrayal of Snow was not, was not as bad as that. It didn't cross the line into Cassandra Clare territory. Um, and at least it ended with him sort of trying to kill her, his love interest. But I still think it's fairly obvious that, you know, the tendency to over-romanticise was still there. 
and that it really impacted the quality of what otherwise should have been a really compelling story about a man being lost to corruption. So I found this quote from the book. I just want to read this quote from the book about him thinking back on Lucy Gray. Quote, Sometimes he would remember a moment of sweetness and almost wish things had ended differently. But it would never have worked out between them, even if he'd stayed. They were simply too different. And he didn't like love, the way it had made him feel stupid and vulnerable. If he ever married, he'd choose someone incapable of swaying his heart. Someone he hated, even, so they could never manipulate him the way Lucy Gray had. So yeah, that quote from the book, and I, I think even that's a little romanticised. Although maybe you could say that it's slightly cold and distant. It kind of strikes me a bit more like that, perhaps. I think that quote, the fact... There's different ways you can interpret that quote. You can interpret it as over-romanticised, but that sentiment that's just expressed in that quote from the book, I think that would be far more powerful if he had actually killed her and committed to it. Like, not, you know... Like, I think that would make him sometimes thinking back on her fondly a little more sinister. As if he's, like, a little regretful, like you would be if you lost a treasured possession, but not enough to feel guilty or to wish it were different, just enough to know that she had the potential to be a weakness for him and thus she had to be eliminated. It's so cold and scary, really, that it says, yes, he cared about her a little, but only enough to know that he had to dispose of her for his own sake. Like, that's a very clinical way of thinking about it, about someone you care about. I think he should have strangled her to death. That's the conclusion I came to. Maybe that would have changed the rating of the film. I don't know. I can't remember what it was rated at, actually. But like, I feel like you could do it if, you, if that's too intense. I feel like you can just imply it or do it. You can do it in such a way. Um, I think either that, either the strangled, because it's really personal. Something quite intimate about it. And it's personal. Um, and it shows he fully meant it. Unlike a half-hearted, like, impersonal gunshot where he... It felt like he wasn't really trying. That's what happened in the film. So either that... Strangled, he has to watch her die. He has to look into her eyes as he's killing her. Or what could also work is he gets her executed. That's impersonal too. You know what? I say that. He has to look into her eyes as he's killing her. It could be also just as effective as if he didn't want to look at her face when he's killing her because that's... But, like, he still commits to it. He still, but it's like, it's like a coward's way out almost because he knows he cares. But he doesn't want to see her face. So, like... Anyway, anyway. Or execution because um, that's impersonal too, but in such a way that it's still very intentional and he has to make a lot of calculated choices to get there. It's a strategy decision, that one, not a crime of passion. So, you know, you have that he gets her arrested, watches her be taken away without intervening and lets her die. Like, that works thematically. That works thematically with the movie because in later life, he never personally killed all those children himself, but he was still responsible for their deaths and their suffering. I think he did actually personally kill people, actually, with the poison, didn't he? Like, his political rivals more. Um, but, but killing her himself could also work thematically. I would have liked that because this is a man who has so much blood on his hands, the blood of innocence. Um, yet in the later Hunger Games, he's distant from it and never really gets his hands dirty. Like, thematically, I think this would have been a good way of showing that he's still responsible for all of that, that the blood is still on his hands in a very, like, visceral way. Stop. You scratchy. Because I need to work. You can't sit on my knee and do that. It's also symbolically him killing off all the good parts of himself that are represented by Lucy Gray. You know, once he's murdered the girl he loves, all bets are off. The last bit of his restraint is snapped. I think it, it would have been it would have been very powerful, I think, if she had died, if he'd killed her um, at his hands, if she died at his hands. Um, the tragedy of someone as young and alive and vivacious as Lucy Gray being extinguished from the world just like that would set up for, would, like, that, that's the setup for Snow for what, for what is to come for him in his future and really bring it home who he ended up becoming. Because how many kids like Lucy Gray, brimming with potential and hope, did he end up murdering over the course of his life? And once he's killed her, someone he supposedly cared about, the rest are easy. Like, I just like that theme. You've got to make a sacrifice for power and he sacrifices her the girl he supposedly loves, like quite literally. Kill her, kill her, I want her dead. I want Lucy Gray dead, it, she should have died. It's a stronger character moment because again, the whole point of this is a man's descent into corruption. So I feel like we needed a strong point where he made a choice, a point of no return where he crosses into irredeemable territory. Like we kind of had that with his friend where he kind of got his friend executed, but not really because it felt like a really weak decision and that whole storyline was weak and stupid. Here's what I want. To really reveal Snow's character and show that his feelings towards Lucy Gray have always been of possessive ownership and not love, when she starts behaving not as he wants her to, in other words, is not controllable, 
That's the whole point of his character. He becomes a tyrannical ruler, remember? He gets to the point where he has to kill her because he doesn't love her more than he loves control. Obviously we know this because of who he later becomes, otherwise he would have been a rebel. He loves her while she is useful and complying. I think she should have threatened to dob him in or something or like just ruin him um, or threatened to stop him doing something awful. So that would contrast them. It would show her putting what is right even over someone she cares about and him having to choose between his ambition and her. Uh, and he doesn't choose her. She's a loose end and he's got to kill her. I think actually having to kill her with his bare hands and look at her as she died would really cement who he is. You know, like that's a choice. Like again, he can be a bit sad about it. Like you would if you lost a nice necklace or a little bit regretful. I, 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 did, I was fond of that. I was fond of that shirt. Such a shame that he couldn't stay in my life. I actually think he should be a bit sad about it because again, it would show how twisted his ideas of right and wrong are. Like, he doesn't want to kill her, but he will if she threatens what he cares about most, power. Um, and then between them, it gets to the point where the only way he can have power over her is to kill her. Like I said, that's a true expression. That's a true like character development of him. He's obsessed with power. You can see that in, in the book, at least, and what he says and who he ends up becoming. So he, he, he doesn't love Lucy Gray. She belongs to him. She's his. He wants he wants power over her, but he can't. And soon, you know, then the only way he can show that, express that power over her, because it's always power he's had, not love. The only way to do that is then to kill her. Um, if she won't, if she won't, uh, if she won't be obedient. I think it would also explain why later on Katniss becomes such a threat to him, and he both admired and despised her. Another strong-willed girl from District 12 who must be eliminated because she's not playing by the rules and creating disharmony and unpredictability in his life. Just as Lucy Gray did decades before. Like, so you've got to ask yourself what this story is about. What is it trying to say? What motivates Snow? I feel like the answer should have been obvious. Power, ambition. But somehow the film totally muddled this message. Well, we know why, because they were going for the, this film. The whole story is about an intimate love story, is what they said it was about, the director. Well, it's not, is it, actually? There was also a bit of a parallel between Lucy Gray and Snow's mother and Snow and his father. So apparently in the book, there's similarities between Lucy Gray and his mother. And in the film, he gives her that scarf thing, whatever it was, that, was, that belonged to his mother. Which, even better, murder her. And in doing so, you've murdered the good parts of yourself, finally becoming your father. This was kind of set up. My point is, having a romance in President Snow's past was not a bad thing. I just don't think it was handled as well as it could have been. There were some roads I wish could have been explored more if it hadn't been so focused on the romance. One thing I really liked, I really liked that it was implied that it was Lucy Gray who taught him the art of performance. She unintentionally showed him how powerful putting on a show can be and how capturing people's admiration and love can be just as effective as scaring them into compliance. He did learn from her. He learned a lot. It's just that love was not one of those lessons. And I would have liked to see how he took those lessons he learned from someone good and applied them to fine tuning the Hunger Games, everything she stood against. So we also have the white rose symbolism throughout this movie, um, which as we know, is very present in the later Hunger Games, where he wears white roses to t try to hide the smell of bloody sores in his mouth that he got from poison he used to poison his political rivals. And this is good, I like this symbol, it's good because the, the, the symbolic meaning, here we go, I'm going all English teacher, the curtains are blue, did, did, did the meaning of it. But it's good because the symbol there is that he can't cover up his crimes no matter how hard he tries. And this is who he is as a person. This is like really the essence of who Snow is. He's trying to put a pretty sheen on brutality like he does with himself, presenting as an educated, respectable, polite young man when he's actually a treacherous snake. Oh, my dear Miss Everdeen, I thought we'd agreed never to lie to each other. Look into my eyes, junk book. Look at my mood, look at my eyes, I'm a slithery hypnotist snake. Like what he ends up turning the Hunger Games into, pretending a child killing contest is actually something glorious and heroic and to be televised and cheered over. He learnt from Lucy Gray, stole those lessons from her, stripped them of all their charm and honesty, and again, we're back to the theme of corruption. He corrupted her legacy. 
And it would work, that would work in a movie where the, you have the themes consistent and it's thematically about corruption. So it's, he's corrupt, he's corrupted personally. She's corrupted by the world. She's killed all these, but then, and then the lessons that he took from her, stole from her about, about her, the art of performance, he takes and he corrupts those lessons as well. And the love that they had, he corrupts that and uses it for child killing, you know? Like every good villain. I think we see how important Lucy Gray was in, in Snow becoming who he was with things like her song about him, quite literally called Pure as the Driven Snow. So she wrote a song about him called Pure as the Driven Snow, a song about why she trusts him, which is clearly very ironic and not accurate. But I like this, how they had that in, in the, obviously that was in the book, but I like how they had it in the film. How that starts a lifetime of him using white and pure imagery to cover up who he truly is, like his name, the White Roses, the Hunger Games. Look, it's a show, it's, this is the glory of Pan and the glory of our civilization. That's a nice one. The colors are lovely, of course. But nothing says perfection like white. Like, Lucy Gray was a brilliant performer and charmer, knew how to grab attention and bring people over to her side. She was also a natural storyteller, um, like with the songs, how she would speak, you know, that kind of thing. Um, she was at home in front of an audience. In that way, she was the opposite of Katniss. Um, and by doing that, she showed Snow the power of a good story, a narrative that people can believe, an image to get behind, how hope is stronger than fear, and how to sell an idea to the people that can manipulate their hopes and dreams and ideals just as effectively as using fear, brutality, and pain. How to make people not only put up with the brutality of the Hunger Games, because they're scared of the boot on their neck of this tyrannical government, but actually actively become involved and invested and support it. Sell them a story, put on a show. Not only capture them in their bodies of that they are obedient because they're scared, but capture their minds as well of, I believe this is a good thing. Not just because I'm scared, but because, yeah. So much of who Snow became was formed by Lucy Gray, and I love that. Her impact on him was clearly huge. It just so happened he used it for bad. But I like, I like this thing that he couldn't escape from her influence. And I just wish the film had been more of that and less lounging in meadows. Because the, the previous thing, that, is genuinely fascinating. Like how you can corrupt good things. How to manipulate people. I wanna see that story. Anyway, that's all I've got to say. Let me know your thoughts, whether you agree, disagree, what you thought of the movie. Brilliant, it's finished now. Comment things, please actually do. It helps the algorithm. Okay. What's the matter? I can't turn I can't turn I'm gonna swallow Jennifer Lopez. Hey, Jennifer Lopez, ah! Hey, Ice Cube, ah! I swallowed you whole. That's why you ain't got no careers no more. Blech.